So first of all, we'd like to really thank all the uh, WAC 2021 committee for the opportunity and the invitation uh, to give a keynote this year. Uh, very much appreciated. And the talk today is going to be on Grass Router's music performance, which will be looking at past, present, and future directions of grassroots and decentralized organization structures for network music performance. So before that, just to uh, yeah, uh, kind of remember WAC 2019, which happened in Trondheim, and it was right before the global pandemic started, and and that has been a big uh, crisis for many uh, like domains and also for for conferencing, and so that uh, well as as we know for WAC 2021 is fully virtual this time, but also the idea is that yeah with virtual and from this uh, pandemic uh, there has been also opportunities even though the crisis and the kind of question is also what can we learn from uh, from these virtual environments and experiences uh, in this context. And so thinking on the keynote and talking with Antonio and the WAC 2021 committee, the idea was to uh, reshape a keynote that should be more interactive. And so just recalling what interactive uh, means from Thesaurus. Um, as you can see here, uh, interactive referring to mutual uh, reciprocal interactional experiences. So the idea with this keynote is also to explore uh, how a, a keynote can be interactive. <clears throat> so the, this talk is going to be divided into three main topics. The three around this uh, grass routers music performance idea and so we will have three like these three parts where there will be about 15 minutes uh, about discussing concepts and then there will be about five minutes of, of interactive experience these for the three subtopics and so we will start with network music and so what is network music uh, network music can be defined as both local or remote uh, networks or configurations where both musicians and computers are connected by a network and they are independent like these uh, connections are independent of the musicians locations so we can as mentioned find both located uh, networks but also remote networks or hybrids mixing both and so one characteristic is the interdependence uh, between these musicians who can influence, can share, and can shape each other's music uh, in real time. And so here you can see a definition by Barbosa on the local musical networks uh, defined as a group of performers who interact in real time in the same physical location on a set of musical instruments with the possibility of this sonic interdependence that is provided by a fast, well, ideally fast local computer network. So a little bit of a timeline looking from the 1950s onwards about what network music um, has been and how it has been explored. We can start more from the angle of uh, the pre kind of internet approach to network music, still exploring like the sharing of uh, the control between the performers with different instruments to then move to the inclusion or the yeah the uh, inclusion of computers as part of the performance and then also how to speak among them to the emergence of the internet and bringing that into performance as well by the hub to then also explore uh, the use of network music uh, with uh, laptops and also mobile phones to then also explore network music as a political and so social political statement, we can say. And so network music has a range of technical challenges, uh, including bandwidth. So this transmission capacity of a computer network versus the demand of this high definition of audio streaming that uh, musicians want to send and receive. Also latency, known, well-known uh, characteristic and issue potentially about this delay 
can, that can uh, come as a consequence of this transmission of audio across the network, where ideally we, we should uh, reach below 25 milliseconds. And then the synchronization between the different computers and audio streams to be at the same time and rate to even also the workspace awareness identifying what individual's voice is doing versus the group's voice. So let's watch a couple of examples of what these grass routers uh, network music mean or how they look like or how they sound like. So one first example comes from this hands-on um, wor uh, workshop that we develop, uh, Alo Alik and, and me. And this is a workshop that has been designed to understand the main concepts in collaborative network music but using a super collider. And so the idea of this workshop was to use net address and the OSC classes uh, in this client server architecture that Super Collider brings so that the different workshop participants could write code and send code to other participants. And then other participants could also uh, either execute that code or send other code. So let's try that one, do it. Why couldn't you call me? Huh? I, I have the error message that you are a resonator and you just send me a phone call. So. Oh, yeah, maybe My I didn't send it to you before because was, I sent you again. Something is going on, right? This connects with this uh, workspace awareness. The other example is Transmusicing One. And so this piece, Transmusicing One, uh, was a collaboration between the female laptop orchestra and women in music tech. And we presented this piece at the Audio Mosley 2017 in London, where we had uh, we were 14 musicians across the globe uh, and had uh, 15 hours time zone difference. Uh, that was uh, pre pre COVID, but yeah, so now it's common. <clears throat> uh, so the range of instruments was varied from field recordings, voice, acoustic instruments, digital, digital instruments. And we had a cluster in the performance venue uh, where there was Ariane Stolfi, who has, uh, is performing today and has performed this morning at the conference, uh, doing live voice and using the participatory open band web interface. Then we had Agnilla Kerure, who was in charge of the audio streams uh, to send them back from the venue to the musicians. And then a live mix of the incoming audio streams from Locus Sonus, because some participants, like some performers were using Locus Sonus uh, to record audio environments um, in the wild, and then ice cast, ice cast for those who were indoors, and then using a web audio interface to collect these audio streams uh, and yeah, mix them on stage. We will just also watch uh, one minute or so. that we are presenting here is a premiere for Transmusicing One. And so it's basically a collaboration between female laptop orchestra and women in music tech. And so we wanted to explore network music and uh, connecting different um, musicians across the world. And so it's an experiment.
Okay, and so uh, from these uh, examples and looking at network music, there are three characteristics that I would like to highlight as we could see them as opportunities, perhaps, uh, of this uh, form of expression. And one is the centralized uh, versus the uh, uh, centralized, I'll explain in a minute, then the grassroots approach, and then nonlinear. So the centralized uh, is known as a complex behavior that emerges from work where the lower level components uh, yeah, work towards a common goal, but they operate at a local level. And then a uh, characteristic is that control is distributed across the network. And so each component is, is responsible equally for contributing to this global uh, endeavor or behavior. Another characteristic is the self-organization that is inherent in, in these systems. So yeah, we are talking about decentralized systems in this case. And so we can see three examples here on the slide. One is the ant colonies. Uh, they are known to, some of them, to work on this uh, decentralized approach, uh, focusing on the local towards a global goal. But also we find in software examples such as the Swarm, this uh, on the bottom left, um, a multi-agent software called Swarm. And here we see a swarm of rabbits and coyotes that, yeah, this, with this software you could model and, and see the behavior from this decentralized perspective. And also an example from the web, is the same web, the World Wide Web, seen as a rhizome, um, where basically as a, as a structure, so if you remove one node, the web, the World Wide Web keeps working and operating. That's an important characteristic. Another um, characteristic of the like three highlights we are making today is grassroots. And you can see grassroots as an active case of decentralized or decentralization. So grassroots can be seen as a collective action used from the local level, but then uh, the effect is to change and it can be at local, regional, national or international level. And it's typically associated to this bottom-up decision-making um, it's also characteristic to be self-organized and it typically connects with participatory democracy. And interestingly, Tim Berners-Lee uh, mentioned at the, uh, at the beginning of the World Wide Web uh, this notion of from the grassroots, grassroots up. Uh, so really World Wide Web, uh, the nature of the World Wide Web uh, started and has been designed to have these uh, grassroots up. So as an example, as we see from the real world, there is uh, on the uh, top left, the map of the agroecological consumers cooperatives in Barcelona, uh, where yeah, there is this direct connection uh, between the consumers and the producers, but also promoting local food and a certain way of uh, growing uh, the food. Uh, vegetables and so on. Then we also have examples uh, in the software hardware world with the open, so open source hardware and open source uh, movements. And this idea also of uh, sharing openly the code, uh, the processes and let others to use it. And a web example here is uh, freesound.org uh, where users from all over the world contribute with sounds, um, recordings, uh, anything that is not music to this uh, website. And it's also a good example of a grassroots approach. Uh, the third characteristic is nonlinear. And a nonlinear system uh, is defined as a system in which the change of the output is not proportional to the change of the input. And so you can see a number of examples 
of nonlinear systems in nature. And then a common example or uh, yes, exemplary example are the nonlinear dynamical systems, <coughs> which describe changes in variables over time uh, that appear to be chaotic and unpredictable. So examples from the real world, we have the butterfly effect or this idea that the fl uh, flap flap of a butterfly uh, can produce a tornado uh, the, on the other side of the world. Then we also have examples from the, the, same, the machine learning community and the use of neural networks and this nonlinear behavior to also find examples on the web. And uh, as you can see here at the top right, this is a representation of uh, the blogosphere, uh, blog conversations about the global financial crisis uh, applying um, yeah, um, chaos, chaos theory to understand this kind of behavior. So now it's, uh, we move to this interactive part. <laughs> So as we've seen, the World Wide Web has been inspired and influenced by the real world. But now even more uh, after this post pandemic, thinking on how can the World Wide Web and then streaming down to the network music, this uh, grass routers uh, music performance, how can like new phenomena, if there are, there are new phenomena can inform back to the real world. So I invite you, there is this path that you can uh, log in and you will find once you log in and I'll share, show again, or can I move this? You can share your ideas of in a post COVID world from online to on site, what elements or ideas from network music, but yeah, more broadly also worldwide web, if you would like, can inform, help address real world problems so do you see this link well? I send it on the chat as well for oh, anyone that so needs it. So then I will post it here. Okay, we see six participants. Nine, 11. <laughs> I guess you can write. Yes, but do you see, are you writing? Because yes, of not course. Not yet, not yet. Yes, you should, you should, you should. Can you try? Yes.
guess we can give one more minute. So yeah, thank you. And I guess that was a nice silent moment, but we were <laughs> connected differently. So thank you for your contributions and you can keep adding if you have further thoughts as well. So I'll close it now, but yeah, that keeps open if you want to keep adding and we can share at the end. Okay, so we move to the second subtopic of this Grass Rogers music performance, and this is the audience centric performance. And most of the work presented in this section is together with Jira Roma. Um, so, participatory mobile pieces are known as a kind of approach to music where the audience follows a set of instructions with or without a conductor. And one type of approach is the audience-centric performances, where the audience become performers makers. And that's the approach uh, of this section. So hand waving uh, is a framework built on JavaScript that allows to create this kind of um, audience, um, yeah, audience uh, centric performances. And so this uh, approach and this framework allows to create uh, yeah, mobile pieces based on accelerometer gesture recognition. So there are two uh, parts, if you like. One, you can train the framework uh, with different gestures. And the second part is that you can then create or compose uh, pieces based on this gesture recognition and map those gestures to sounds uh, or events, sound events, sonic events, or also visual events, uh, whatever idea you have. So yeah, this um, framework has been developed as a web application and has been used uh, deep neural networks, a classifier to do all this training. So you can see on the right, uh, some of the gestures. Uh, that have been trained such as circles, up and down, tilt, or left and right. And you can also see like these two uh, uh, use cases that can be applied from this framework on the top right. Uh, after creating uh, a number or just, well, a few uh, uh, participatory uh, mobile pieces based on this framework, most of them, but others not, uh, that I'll talk in a minute, some of them in collaboration with Gerard, Roma, or uh, we will see four pieces basically, but there are uh, two that are in collaboration, one that I, I did myself and the last one did by Gerard, but we took these four uh, music pieces, if you like, and um, analyzed them using a conceptual framework this time in order to see, to understand these pieces a little bit more. So we end up, ended up with 13 composition dimensions that deal with the role of the performer, the role of the audience, the location of sound, and the type of feedback, among others. And so once we defined these 13 composition dimensions, we then went through the four pieces to see to what extent these dimensions were present and yeah, what was the level of, of presence. And so we, uh, kind of created a radar chart for each of these four performances so that you could have a visual representation from these dimensions against the, the performance to understand it better. And the approach has been for this to uh, propose a framework that, it, that 
others can also use to analyze this type of performances, but also to create new ones. So where are the composition dimensions that we are talking about? So there are five main areas. One is human configuration that refers to the performers on stage, whether they are or not on stage, or the mutual interaction between the audience's actions to what extent they can uh, influence each other. Similarly, the mutual interaction between stage performers and the audience performers. So that would be this human configuration area. The other one would be the mobile technologies and how the sensors are used and also whether visual and haptic feedback is used. A third area is sound system and whether there is acoustic mirroring between the, like assuming there is a PA system in a, in a traditional performance venue, whether there is acoustic mirroring between the phones and the PA system and also complementary acoustic information, whether there is this complementary information between these two systems, the mobile, eco mobile world ecosystem and the PA system. Similarly with projection system, whether it is visual mirroring or complementary information. And finally, the computer music system to see whether there is any pre-scored elements, uh, whether the system has memory about past events and what is the use of samples ranging from low bandwidth where, uh, the, where the pieces typically use synthesized sounds towards high bandwidth where the systems use more like um, uh, audio samples. So let's see these four case studies. So uh, watching one minute of each of the pieces so you can get a sense. We start with the do the buzzer shake where there is just at the beginning some instructions to the, to the audience but then it's the audience who are exploring the tool with the gestures and, and the idea, there are different parts, but the idea is that they learn from each other uh, the gestures that are relevant for the piece. Another example, hyper-connected action painting, where here the exploration, well, first there is a performer on stage uh, who is um, also launching uh, like complementary audio, like complementary uh, acoustic information, but then the audience, apart from creating sounds, can also, uh, from their gestures, uh, draw or paint on a canvas, following like this Jackson Pollock's style. So the third piece, Imaginary Berlin, uh, this piece explores again, like two, like there is a performer on stage with complementary information 
of acoustic information and visual information vers versus the audience who is exploring uh, with the gestures, different sounds, and altogether exploring the local sounds, in this case from Berlin. And the last example, no merge conflicts by Zero Roma, where in this piece, an algorithmic uh, performer, if you like, uh, is present or not present on stage, but somehow is present on stage and establish a dialogue with the, with the, with the, with the audience. Um, and so basically all the, like the music produced by the, by the audience using the mobile app, um, this agent basically selects uh, some of the patterns that are then displayed both hourly but also visually on stage. Okay, so now we move to the, the second interactive bit of the second part, <laughs> which is going to be to relaunch or try like the one, one of these four pieces, the hyperconnected action painting, where there are these three gestures, the horizontal brush, vertical brush, splashing, that will trigger both sounds and some painting in this virtual canvas. Uh, just to mention, though, so this piece has four, uh, four parts uh, for the demo, they have been shortened, but typically code from 2017 becomes, is it 20? Yeah, becomes obsolete kind of, right? So the world changes and so, uh, yeah, mainly uh, given security issues with the iOS, but also depending on the browser. So it actually this demo currently only works as it is uh, on Android and on Firefox. So sorry about this yeah, exclusion, but it also please uh, be kind because yeah, this is legacy code and also just raises, you know, how fast everything goes. And yeah, also we, we should keep the code up if we want to run it as well, but yeah at least we can just get a little bit of flavor. So um, the idea is gonna be you can connect, if you have an Android and Firefox installed, you can go to this web, uh, this link here, 
And if you can just wait uh, before pressing the start button, um, we'll be resetting the system here. I'll connect also from a phone. And you can, okay, let's say if it connects. <clears throat> yeah, okay, I have, <laughs> have it here now. So I guess let me reset again. And we can now share the canvas and maybe start. See if it goes well. Yeah. You can, if you're using it, you could also unmute, perhaps. It's also a little bit slower, uh, probably because of the server. But yeah, be kind. <laughs> What's up? Oh, cool. Someone is, yes, thank you.
Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hope that for some it works somehow, but yeah. And we move now to the third part, the AI powered life coding. And so this um, like part looks into machine learning and life coding. And just to mention, there are different angles, uh, quite a different number of different angles of, ma of machine learning applied to life coding that you can see list listed here, ranging from machine listening to online training to other approaches uh, such as rule learning or performance style generation, uh, gamification, and so on. So it's uh, it's a it's an early stage, but quite um, um, dense in terms of like different approaches and very interesting time. I would say for life coding and also machine learning, hopefully. But anyway, in this context, there is this project Milk Auto uh, that I'm involved, which is looking at a virtual agent for music information retrieval in life coding. And so that's within the HDI network plus theme of art, music and culture, uh, where there is an emphasis on how legibility, negotiability and agency can be used to address some tension between human creativity and the use of AI, and in this case, applied to life coding. And so this project has been a collaboration with partners Eclectic, uh, Leicester Hackspace, Luisec, Phonos, and the MTI at, at the Montfort, and as collaborators, Top Lab Barcelona, Flucoma, and the Free Sound team. And so we've been doing workshops in three cities. All of this, of course, was this during this year, um, during the pandemic, so we had to do everything online or hybrid approaches, and also performances uh, connected to the three cities, London, Barcelona, and Leicester, and particularly connected to the uh, partners who belong to or are based in these three cities. And so just briefly to summarize how this Milk Auto works, in short, Milka. So Milka is a, a kind of an environment that works on Super Collider and it's, it proposes a life coding approach to retrieve sounds from free sound. But in this case, it's an additional layer to the previous Milk, which uh, is also doing that. But with Milka, you can uh, train a model uh, that can kind of predict good from good, good sounds from bad sounds. And you can take it, you know, uh, define what is for you good or bad sounds. So it gives some independence to the life coder to take this uh, library and then customize it to, to the needs of, of the life coder. And so just to mention, it's using the Flucoma API for the machine learning part um, from the Flucoma team at the University of Huddersfield. Um, and then of course the FreeSound Quark uh, to query the FreeSound database. So yeah, and so the web, the web basically here comes from this communication with the FreeSound database in real time and doing all this machine learning um, classification in real time using these technologies. So just briefly to connect with these three tenets of the, of the project, which is, yeah, I mentioned it's an EPSRC funded project and the three themes are this, um, legibility, agency, and negotiability. And so how the, do those speak to life coding and machine learning? So legibility, uh, this is, I would say, an easy one because with life coding, there's already uh, from the very early days, this manifesto where the idea is to show the screens to the audience, but also yeah, to show the screens basically so everyone can see what you are doing, but also it's a way of sharing your thoughts and your processes. Um, but then uh, in addition to kind of the life coding ecosystem and this approach to eligibility, uh, the language, the milk language um, is quite high level. So it is also to be quite uh, straightforward of the things you do. And then for the kind of the machine learning and the training, the idea is also to provide information, key information 
in the console so that the live coder, both in the training, but also in the, in the performance modes, um, is aware of what is happening. So here for the training, there is acute an accuracy measure. So the live coder when training the model knows how is it going. Uh, in terms of agency, so also connected to this, to this idea that the life coder can um, train their own model based on their ideas. This is very much inspired by the interactive machine learning approach of HCI, and in particular how Fibri and Kramit uh, wrote this paper on interactive machine learning as a creative musical tool. And so the idea is here that the life coder can take um, the library, think about why do I need uh, this model for, and it could be a music style, a music preference, different instruments, uh, snapshots, and then uh, build a model from, from, from there. And the third theme, negotiability. Uh, so here the idea is that throughout the project, uh, there is a co-design approach, so that there is a conversation about how the tool can improve so that it's uh, meaningful to the life coders. So that's why the workshops have been relevant. So there has been this conversation, but also the concerts, uh, seeing how others are, are using the tool is also informative and the code repository as well as a kind of distributed asynchronous way to also uh, adapt the tool, uh, also document how to improve it or create new features so that uh, it speaks to, to the needs of the community. So there are a couple of examples um, of how the tool Milka has been used. This first example comes from a performance organized at uh, Phonos quite recently. And it's still, this is a sneak peek. You will just see uh, before the premiere just a little bit. And it's a live coding evening from scratch by uh, four members of the Top Lab Barcelona community. Here we find the audio freak in his natural environment, the home studio. You can tell by his pale sickly coloration that he has been native for quite some time now. Let's watch his reaction as he discovers that he has accidentally aced all of his work for the past few weeks. Oh shit. No. Well grab by your arms! Sag fall! What?
As mentioned, this is a sneak peek, so um, there will be a premiere soon um, by Phonos. So yeah, if interested, just to let you know. This second example is Dirty Dialogues. It's a similar uh, approach. To we were using the tool, in this case at the Montfort, at MTI, um, the centers. So here we collaborated between uh, different musicians, not necessarily live quarters. So uh, we collaborated with the Dirty Electronics Ensemble, so bringing DIY on board. And so they were a number of them, as you can see, John Richards with um, uh, different uh, contributors to the Dirty Electronics Ensemble. They were operating with radical chips, motors, and found objects. Then we also had Jonathan Moss uh, bringing trombone, flute, sax, saxophone, and using also Milka, and also a Kinect sensor to, uh, connected to Max. And finally, myself using the Milka. And then we had a Q&A where Sam Roach was moderating. Also, this um, video will be premiered later uh, this year. Just will show a little bit of a sneak peek also. In this case, it's a still image. And yeah, just to mention, this is like 30 minutes or like, yeah, 30 minutes or so, even a little bit more after like so many months without being able to perform. So you can, you will notice when you, if you're interested in watching the ones it's published, 30 minutes, so much energy is just, you know, <laughs> anyway. So final uh, interactive uh, experience. If you can please connect here to the to this website, uh, uh, dj.net 4000. Um, I will also demonstrate this tool, Milka. Um, and so you you can connect to this chat if you like, and maybe if you can perhaps suggest or tell in what city you are based or something, maybe we can retrieve uh, a tag of your city. So. I'm based in, in Sheffield now, so we'll trigger a sound from Sheffield. And that was this one. Hopefully you will listen to it. And then we have personal now. Let's see that one so we are clean. We also have Rotterdam. Barcelona, there are two more, so let's retrieve two more. <laughs> so 
sorry, I, this one I should, it should have been D. Anyway, I'll put it here. And then Baton Rouge, okay. Oh, look at this, there are more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so good. Maybe we can group some sounds in the same group. Let's do F with more. Vancouver. Sheffield. Okay, another one. Okay, another one. Okay, so not finding. Yes, Sevilla, well, it's, as you can see, some analysis files that don't exist, but if we the idea would be to search it, adding maybe another keyword. Okay, let's try Paris. And yes, settings. Wow, so many cities! <laughs> and, uh, I'll create another group as well. Bangalore. Let's do oh. Wouldn't well, this work as well? Yeah. All these bad sounds, what about this? Okay. I need to conclude, so let's see. Local host, okay.
while this is going down this conscious of time so um, Russ Rutter's music performance can be seen as a native approach to making music through the World Wide Web and we have seen we call it GRP now uh, exemplified with three um, approaches applications network music audience centric music and AI powered live coding so we've seen that GMP manifests uh, decentralization and bottom-up ideas, as well as showcases nonlinear approaches, which uh, return unpredictability and chaotic behaviors. And we can say that GMP is in its infancy, but it's a promising area to explore creatively these notions of decentralization on the open web. So we'd like to really thank you for your participation. And special thanks to all colleagues and institutions who have helped with and or supported the realization of all these projects presented in this talk. And also thank you to the contributors to the open web. And these are the references. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'll stop sharing now. Thank you very much, Anna. I think it was a beautiful keynote and definitely very interactive. <laughs> Thank you, Antonio. <laughs> You're getting lots of claps. Um, <laughs> I think we went out of time, though, right? Let's... Yeah, I think we can still have time for two questions. Luis, is that all right? Two questions. Yeah. Well, Luis? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think it's, it's fine. <laughs> we can have, if, if people have questions. So, yes, guess I think people can unmute themselves, maybe. If there's any question already, just, just go ahead and ask. If there are no questions until now, I have one. So obviously with the isolation from COVID, I think it will be natural that uh, there a bigger interest for decentralized network music would surface, right? I mean, people are isolated from each other, so they probably want to keep on making music. Um, did you see like a rise on, on, on the interest on this topic, like on online forums or newer software appearing? Uh, did you see any growth in, in the community due to the, to the COVID basically? Well, I guess uh, somehow there was already a body, let's say, of research and applications supporting uh, network music, distributed network music. But yeah, certainly f uh, during COVID, maybe you've seen both the evolution of this uh, software, but also new software. Uh, and you can see, for instance, in the conferences, like uh, we put a conference, there are, you know, like uh, new software presented that supports, uh, like, yeah remote or distributed uh, performances. So I would say that yes, but also I guess it has been also uh, an extreme case of then raising how important it is or you know, the value of performing on site with musicians. So I guess also it has been, it has also brought um, this impression I would say, but yes, uh, COVID, if we can see any good side of, of how it went, probably it has been like yeah, the evolution or promotion of more uh, online experiences. Um, and there, there are yeah, different 
uh, blog posts about uh, new apps and, but yeah. Thank you. Any question from the audience? I have another one then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so on this audience centric performance, uh, there was a lot of use from the mobile phone and I guess there are a lot of people contributing to the final piece, right? Do you have like any methodology or any way of thinking on how to handle this, all this data that's coming at the same time? Do you normally just uh, use everything for the performance? Do you filter some more relevant data than, than if there is any more relevant data than, than less, less relevant data? So from the, this uh, paper that we go through with our own performing audiences, uh, one kind of final thought or uh, conclusion is that we could use more the, the phone uh, in terms of these performances, uh, ranging from the use of the sensors. Uh, and I'm not sure if you mean the data for the real-time performance or do you mean for data analysis later? So For the real-time performance, the real -time. I would say. So yeah, we found that we are using uh, less than what what is uh, available. But again, what what should what shall drive the piece? Is it the technical needs or like you know exploring or or the the artistic needs? So I guess it's also finding the balance. But it's always good to explore more fully what the phone gives you. However, I found now with this um, legacy code that it's getting more like it's getting there is more security layers, which I understand, but then getting to the sensors and the possibility of the phones uh, requires, yeah, more uh, more work. <laughs> so before I think, like, yeah, I understand the security, but it's uh, also would be it's important to have APIs so that you can access more easily to the to what you can get from the phone, so that you can take, uh, yeah, the maximum. I think that's it. Thank you so much, Anna. I think it was a very nice keynote and it was a pleasure having you on the Web Audio Conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much.